Okay. okay, so I welcome everybody, um, our friends from Pakistan. Uh, it's almost uh, uh, 9.30 there. Uh, we have colleagues from different parts of the world. For us, it's almost uh, 10.30 in, uh, at night. Some of them would be um, awake for uh, midnight, obviously. Um, so I welcome our speaker for today is uh, Professor Peter Zeitler. Uh, who will be talking about what came down must have gone up, links between shivalic rocks and their source. So um, uh, as all of you know, this this series, uh, uh, which uh, started uh, more than three months back, and today we are celebrating the 15th uh, talk uh, of this series. And uh, it's very uh, exciting to see that there's a lot of interest from people around the world and uh, uh, the byproduct of COVID, for example, these uh, teams and Zooms, these have uh, uh, made this thing really very uh, handy for us. And it's, uh, it's very good to see people uh, attending it. We get emails, we get interest from people who are interested in giving their talks. So if you want to give your talk and you think that uh, the, the, the title might be relevant to the webinar series, you can write to Bob or myself. Uh, Bob will see, or we will see that how we can tune your talks to the to the greater theme of the webinar. So I will not take much time, and uh, would ask Bob to introduce speaker and also discuss uh, future speakers. Bob, over to you, please. Right. Th thank you very much, uh, Irfan. And uh, I want to start out by thanking Muktiar and his team in in Quetta, who are managing the uh, Microsoft Teams for us this evening. Uh, before. Before we uh, start this evening's presentation, I just want to uh, let people know what's coming up. Uh, next week, we've got uh, Mona Lisa from Qadi Azam University in Islamabad, and she's going to be talking about seismic hazards and earthquake situations in northern Pakistan. Uh, the next speaker is going to be Terry Serling from the University of Utah, and he'll be discussing uh, his work on isotopes in the Shualiks as well as worldwide. And... Uh, then coming up uh, sort of on deck, we've got uh, Yanni Naiman, and she'll talk about uh, regional uh, Shivalik correlations across Pakistan and India. And then uh, we've got Advait Junkar, who's coming to us, and I think he's going to be talking about uh, fossils, and I don't have his title exactly yet. And we've got a couple of other people as well uh, who are still to be precisely scheduled. Uh, it does look like at some point in July, it might be that we, we go on a summer break. So <laughs> right now it's not quite clear, but that is what we might be planning on doing. This evening so, is my... Yes. That's really needed, Bob. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, especially in, in Pakistan, of course, it gets very hot in the summertime. So maybe we can have a little bit of a break, but uh, we'll see how that works out. Uh, but I want to uh, take the opportunity this evening or, or <laughs> this morning, wherever you are, to introduce... Uh, my colleague, uh, Peter Zeitler, who I've known for many, many years, and uh, Peter and I were students together at Dartmouth College, uh, and it was a, a wonderful time <laughs> way back then. We, we had these, you know, we had very formal parties and celebrations, and and uh, it seems to me, I'm, now I'm remembering this this event where um, at one point I was, I was my wife Mary and I were teaching in, in, uh, in Peshawar, and uh, we had uh, made all these arrangements by telegram. We used to communicate by telegram. Very amazing. And um, Peter was coming to do some field work, and he was bringing some kind of special Thanksgiving cake or something. And uh, we, Mary and I had been looking forward to this tremendously. We we're going to pick him up at the airport in Islamabad or something, and there was this international airplane coming in. It was going to have Peter and this special cake. And there was some kind of a local crisis, and I think the crisis involved the embassy or something or other. And um, Peter had left Hanover and had gotten to Frankfurt, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, somehow a signal got to him that he, that the college d determined that it was not safe for him to continue to to Pakistan. And I believe he turned around in Germany or something. And uh, Mary and I keenly missed our chance to see Peter that time in in probably 1980 one or somewhere like that so so in any case <laughs> the connections between <laughs> my family and peter and his family go back many 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 years and uh, peter did his, his work primarily at dartmouth college 
and he's been at Lehigh University for many years. And Peter's done fieldwork throughout the Himalayas, uh, working in Tibet and in Khoistan, uh, as far north as Mongolia, and of course in the uh, in the northern uh, Pakistan area. And so I'm going to just turn the floor over to Peter, and uh, looking forward very much to your talk. All right, thanks. Um, I'm going to do AV things and try to start here so I can talk to a slide. And so we'll see how this works. Um, OK. Um, if I'm doing things correctly, everyone should be seeing. Um, we, we we see it. Yes, we see okay, it. OK. All right, so then let me start. So before I do anything else, let me just thank Bob and others for organizing this, which has been a great series. I haven't been able to attend all of them, but um, that's because of the time difference, but I, you know, it's certainly looking at some of these on YouTube. It's been it's been a wonderful chance to get together, and also see you know a bunch of new faces and some old faces <coughs> as well. Um, it's you know, as I'll, I'll make clear in a minute, I've spent um, a lot of time in Pakistan actually, and in, in the Himalayas. Um, so, so thanks and thanks to all of you for coming because I you know it's your morning and it's my night, but it's all hard for everyone. So as you you can tell from this title slide. Um, you might wonder where I'm going, and, and that should be give you a hint that um, I'm going to get to the Shualiks eventually for a bit, but we're going to take a kind of a roundabout tour um, that that travels through Tibet and um, and the mountains rather than the, the foothills and, and the, the Shualik sediments. And so um, just to drag out a really old figure to provide a little bit of context, um, one thing I want to mentioned to everyone, which I think, you know, you've already had a talk on this subject in this series, but just to remind you of what thermochronology is, which is really what I do more than anything else, is that it's a kind of geochronology that records temperature histories, not ages. And so it, a general rule of thumb is that if you date most minerals by most isotopic systems, you're not getting the original age of the rock. You're getting its temperature history because of diffusion. And so that's been called thermochronology. And you know, sometimes it's still confused by people who think you're getting formation ages, but you're not. And so as an example of shown here in purple, um, if you take the mineral zircon and you date it with what's called the fission track method, you're actually dating the time the mineral basically passed through 300 degrees C or the equivalent. And that also means that um, if you just imagine typical depths of um, geothermal gradients, you know, 250 to 300 degrees is something like 10 kilometers down. So if we go to the, the sort of a top of a mountain um, that's sort of shown, you know, here on the left in this cartoon from long ago, you know, if we were to date a zircon, it would represent the time it took to get from down here at the closure depth to the surface. And we could say something about the net cooling history and then maybe the erosion rate or uplift rate. Um, but the other thing to keep in mind, and I just want to, you know, this is something I think all everyone at this seminar knows, but sometimes we forget that you know there's these linkages between the sources and the sinks. So you can be obsessed with you know the Shawaliks and just worry about what the Shawaliks are doing and what fossils are in them or what climate records or what thrust faults are happening. And you can also run around in the mountains and just be excited by mountains and granites and metamorphic rocks and forget that in fact the record of those goes somewhere, which is in fact the Shawaliks. So there's you know two things to sort of provide the context for the talk. One is you know what you can do with thermochronology, and the other one is um, you know what we can do with source sink relationships. Now um, I I do have to provide some old lang syne and some you know evidence of roots. So um, I was able to do a senior thesis, an undergraduate thesis in Pakistan, and that in case you can't tell, that's me in the middle. And the person to my left is the, the famous Dr. Bob Reynolds, uh, Pam Ray, a contemporary of mine, Gary Johnson, Muhammad Khan, and we're in Jalam in 1978. And so what, what, I, what I'm really trying to say is my formative geological life was really based in Pakistan. I mean, all the work I did for all my degrees, it turns out, was in Pakistan. And so the geology of this country really influenced the way I guess I think, because that's what I, that's where I, you know, because when you're a beginning student, you know nothing, and you just read textbooks, but when you actually see rocks, it's terrifying, but you actually see the real rocks in the field. And I saw the rocks in, in the, starting with the Shawaliks. And I, I just want to say that, um, I want to do two things with this slide. One is to just 
acknowledge how lucky I was in timing and also make a, a couple points for people in Pakistan who may not realize this, but um, a lot of really significant things that we now do in mountain belt studies actually orini- originated in studies in Pakistan, partly through the Dartmouth Peshawar collaboration. And so for me, I stumbled onto a new method of dating provided by Chuck Naser, shown in the bottom right. This, this, this fission track dating method that is temperature sensitive, that can give you erosion and temperature histories. This had hardly been used anywhere except briefly in the Alps. At the same time, you know, plate tectonics people were getting interested in the, what's happening in the continents and the, the Himalaya were the, you know, the type example, but were little explored at the time. And then, you know, working in the Shawalik sandbox, I mean, it, you know, you can't avoid thinking of this as an active system. So rather than thinking, you know, of events in the deep past, when you work in Pakistan, you, you're surrounded by the active geology, both in the Shawaliks and in the mountains. And that's, that's something that's, you know, I think was lucky for me. And the other thing, I just, just to give acknowledgement, is to have great colleagues, people like Bob, and also mentors. And three of those mentors are shown here, who I really want to call out. One of them is Rashid Tarakeli, who is director of the Center of Excellence in Peshawar. He's a wonderful person, very supportive, um, did some remarkable work in the really heroic days of, of accessing Kohistan in places. Noy Johnson was my thesis advisor and was tremendously helpful in getting things done. And then Chuck Naser, who helped de- develop fission track dating, was also an advisor. You know, sadly, all three of these people have passed on, uh, but they're worth knowing who they are. Um, they are great people. So I'm I'm really fortunate to have, you know, had this kind of mentorship from these people, and then um, been able to sort of grow up geologically in in this this great place. Now, um, making a transition, um, I've got this from Cosm John's website. This is one of Rashid's early maps, the geology of of northern Pakistan, circa I guess 1980-ish or something, and. You know, this is about a time that I started doing my PhD work, and I think Kazim was, and Asif and other people were beginning to work up in the mountains, um, beginning to get make some sense of this complicated terrain. The, you know, the roads were not too bad. The Karakoram Highway was new, so you could actually drive up into the Kawasan on a paved road, and and so, um, you know, this is exciting um, times. And so my PhD thesis involved, you know, using this map and and topo maps that were actually incorrect. It was you know, no, no GPS back in those days um, to kind of get samples and, and work on um, work on fission track dating. And, and so what I, you know, without showing you any of the details or even the sample locations, you know, synthesis of what I got just from the zircon fission track dates is shown here, where the dark lines kind of show you terrain boundaries of, you know, Kohistan arc and then the Jellum reentrant, and then you can see color coded here are the fission track zircon fission track ages. And remember, these are these are to first order. These ages represent the time it took to go from 10 kilometers to the surface, and then obviously the net average. And you know, one of the staggering outcomes was that you know, in this high mountain terrain of Kohistan and and points further north, is a tremendous range of ages. So. You know, in, within Nanga Parbat, ages were as young as one million years. And then over there in Deer, um, in the west of Kohistan, you get ages, you know, over 60 million years. So, you know, clearly um, what was happening was not a uniform uplift of a block or something like that. The, just serious active tectonics were going on. In terms of what you could call, you could call it landscape evolution or the long-term erosional um, response to uplift. So, you know, I did this work. I don't want to go into any detail on it. Um, I, I left, finally, Dartmouth after doing three degrees there. And I, I went to Australian National University, and I spent five years learning other dating methods. And when I got back to the United States and Lehigh University, um, again, in collaboration with Peshawar, we had a number of projects that began to work on the um, the, the crystalline rocks of the Himalaya. So I moved away from the Shualiks. And I, and I do promise to get back to Shualiks, but this talk may be stretching the definition of the series a bit. Um, and so what I want to do now is, is just take some really broad context um, and step into some features that we've been studying a lot um, for the last 25 or 30 years. And these features are um, Nanga Parbat, which is shown inside that circle as this little high spot here, as I'm sure many of you know. 
And then a very similar feature called Namshi Barwa, which is at the other end of the Himalayan chain. Um, and I'll be talking about these in, in fine detail, but just to provide a little um, regional context, which I think is important to the story. Um, what we're, our terminology is that the, the Indian plate diving under um, Asia is a lithospheric plate, obviously. And um, where that collision then happens, um, you know, in the corners, we call lithospheric indenter corners. These are plate corners. They have strike slip boundaries on the side and a convergent part um, at the business end. And developed around these indenter corners of the lithosphere in the crust are these, ro not rotations, but changes in trend. And these are called the big syntaxes. So there's the Western Himalayan syntaxis um, located you know, um, with the Hindu Kush and the Pamir and the Himalayan trends changing strike. And then in, in the Eastern Himalayan syntaxis, you have that uh, developed um, with the Three Rivers region here and then the change in strike. And so you've got you know, these syntaxes um, developed over in denner corners and then in, developed inside of them are these very tiny features, Namshi Barwa and Nanga Parbat. And I'm going to spend the nef next few middle part of the talk telling you what these are like. And, and I, there's a method to this madness. I'm not trying to just talk about bedrock geology. This, this actually has implications for the Shualiks. Um, the other thing I want to point out, which is, I think, important to the story, is that you know, much has been written, as you all know, that how continuous the, the Himalayas are along strike. You know, the Shualiks are in the front, the lesser Himalayas, the thrusts, um, the suture zone, the higher Himalaya, less, you know, and there is a remarkable continuity from along the range. But the ends of the origin are different. And, um, you know, for instance, in the West, you have a, basically a knot, um, you have extra mass and you have this large region of elevated topography in the Hindu Kush and Pamir. Whereas in the east, you have more of a free boundary. In Burma, there's subduction going on, uh, east-west subduction. And you can, there's actually, um, if you look at the GPS field shown in the upper right, um, the GPS field, you know, wraps, you know, 270 degrees around the syntaxis from north-south convergence to finally east-west convergence uh, down in Myanmar which is you know, a remarkable feature. So, so the, the east is much more of a free boundary. And you can also see, as I mentioned, this, this Three Rivers region um, bordering Namshi Barra's area, where these, you know, these rivers have been brought into um, very close proximity, very strange watersheds that are very long and thin. So, the, so in the end, in detail, the, the geology and tectonics of both ends are not identical, even if they're broad similarities. Now, I, I, this is a bit of a scary DEM rendered in very bright red colors, but I just want to make a point about something, uh, looking at landscapes. All along the Himalayan front, it turns out the high peaks of the Himalayas define a small circle that's consistent with subduction and, and, and convergence. That breaks down at the edges. And the other thing you'll notice from this DEM is that nowhere along the main Himalayan range do the rivers make it across. So there's actually a dynamic um, feedback um, extrusion and erosion process in coupling that's actually defeating the river's headward advance. But that's not true at the corners. So in the west, you can see how far um, incision has got along the Indus and related tributaries. And the same is true for the Yarlung Tsang Po um, in the east. And that little white spot here in the east, if you can see my laser pointer, is Namshi Barwa, right next to the Arlong Songpo. And the little white spot here on the west is Nanga Parbat, right next to the Indus. So both of these little mountain massifs are located right next to where these very large rivers escape from behind the mountain belt, and they leave Tibet and actually um, enter the foreland. So that you know, there's some really interesting similarities between the ends of the origin in the west and the east. Now, one thing I wanted to say is, um, what actually happened is that we did a lot of work at Nanga Parbat and had some ideas about what was we thought was going on, and we went to test these ideas and explore them at Namshi Barwa. I'll be giving you a synthesis, synthesis of all the data that we um, collected, uh, but. Um, but there was, in fact, a sequence where Pakistan came first and 
Tibet came later. Um, so one of the things um, you, you notice is when you get, when you get to these settings, uh, on the left is Nanga Parbat, and the uh, bottom right is Namshibarwa, is that these define the greatest relief on Earth, um, a continental relief on Earth. And so between the summits and the big rivers next door, you have about seven kilometers of relief um, as the rivers pass these mountains, which is, so you have tremendous potential energy for uh, mass wasting and erosion. Um, and, you know, you can see that when you visit. So on the upper left is the north face of Nanga Parbat. Uh, bottom left is the 1841 landslide in the Indus off Nanga Parbat, uh, not too far from Chalas. Um, bottom right is just, um, you know, how steep the terrain is where the Indus and the Astar rivers try to cross the massif. And then the top two pictures on the right are, oops, sorry about that, are of the Yarlung Song Po. So remember, this is the very large river, the Yarlung Song Po, that drains Tibet. And it actually falls off the plateau. And on the left, you can see this hair bend it makes. And right in the bottom right of the image, um, the entire river falls off a waterfall in, in this place called Rainbow Falls. And on the right, you can just see how ridiculous the gorge is for the Yarlung Song Po. That's the river at low water. And you can see this fantastic incision of, of bedrock. These are not sediments that are being incised. So, you know, the downstream cutting of these rivers and their power is tremendous. And we'll get back to that. The other thing, sorry, I'm getting double hits here. The other thing we noticed um, eventually, although it took us a while to open our eyes, was that although not abundant, um, both Nanga Barba and Namchi Barra have, a, you know, some consistent granite or granitic phases melts. And so you see at, on the left, you see um, um, at the top, one of these strange tourmaline bearing dikes cross cutting the local fabric. And then the bottom left is a more pegmatite dike. And then you see granite dikes in the upper right. And, and you know, there are larger granite bodies at Naga Parbat. And I, I was focused on other things, but eventually, you know, I woke up. I don't know what it took to wake me up that, you know, we could date these and, and do really interesting things. And I'll show you that in a moment. So based on um, a lot of work by many people, um, some of them attending this talk, um, you know, sort of try to work out the, the basic structure of first Naga Parbat and then Gyal Peri, um, Namshjibarwa in the east. And the interesting thing is that both of these mountains sit on what are basically antiformal pop-up structures. So the green rocks in these, these cartoon maps are island arc rocks that were thrust over Indian rocks. And then later, there's been a pop-up structure that thrusts the, or pushes these Indian plate rocks back up against the um, arc rocks. And so in fact, the suture is reactivated or it's, it's actually the same terrain boundary, but a different, different fault. And you can see that these features are pretty small. I, I told you they're small. They're, they're, you know, 25 to 50 kilometers across, which is tiny, right, compared to the whole mountain belt. Now, there's a lot on this slide, and I don't want to spend all night talking or all morning for you talking about this, but um, let's start on the top. On the top is a zircon crystal from one of those thin dikes at Nanga Parbat. And if you look closely on the left-hand image, um, which is the actually transmitted light image, you can see that there's this roundish feature here. And that's a xenocrystic zircon um, around which this igneous zircon nucleated and grew. And all these little spots are ion microprobe um, dating attempts. And all the spots on the zircon are 1.8 million years old. So this dike is 1.8 million years old, but the xenocrystic core is 1.8 billion. So I guess you could say that's a large unconformity, just a very small one. So you basically have 1.8 billion years of, of gap. And so these rocks, you know, partially melted and then in these dikes grew new zircon. Um, and so if you actually, these complicated figures in the bottom are showing many things. So let me uh, focus on the left-hand one first. That's Naga Parbat. All the circles are showing you cooling ages of biotite by argon argon. And that cools, that's a temperature of about 300 degrees. And the key thing is that right near the summit of Nanga Parbat, there are ages that are well under 1.5 million. So there's 300 degrees of cooling in a million years. Um, the red sort of um, symbols here are zircon ages that are less than 2 million years on igneous dikes. The red dashed line 
is an area in which the rocks are a low pressure granulite metamorphism. And the two other colored blobs here are seismic tomography showing regions where the rocks are anomalously hot at depth. So um, there's this bullseye of very young cooling ages, very young igneous um, dike ages, and the seismology and also some magnetotelluric measurements we made suggest there's there's no giant leuco. These are not the result of a young, you know, leuco granite body that's just resetting everything. This is sort of hot, dry basement rock that's being rapidly eroded. Um, and the same holds if you look on the right side for for Namshi Barra Barwa and its satellite peak Yala Peri. There's a zone of low pressure granulites. There's very very young igneous ages of less than a million. And the, again, the young cooling ages. For Nampshibara, we have seismic um, data. The northern boundary of the feature is a steep, basically vertical fault that's accommodating the vertical uplift um, of this feature and it's popping up. So we have you know, these different lines of evidence for what's going on in these basically active metamorphic massifs. Um, if you look at the pressure temperature diagram in the upper left, this synthesizes data for both the Naga Parba and Namshi Barwa. The thing to focus on is that at medium to low pressures, you have basically what's called um, it's it's a isothermal uh, decompression. See these rocks over several million years rapidly approached the surface and they didn't cool at all, and they got to low pressures where they began to partially melt. And that's where you see this low pressure metamorphism developed. And then very after that, they cool very rapidly to the surface and, and arrive at the surface. Um, on the right are a bunch of zircon crystals that are analyzed from Gallipari in the eastern um, side in Tibet. And the, the, the numbers on the crystals are actually the ages measured by ion microprobe. And you can see that these, these zircons have a fabulously complicated history. Some of them have Precambrian cores and then have grown young rims that get progressively younger. Um, and you know, our interpretation is that there was a, a stew, if you want to call it, of partially molten rocks that are growing zircon and that, that it's really the rapid uplift and erosion that stops the zircon growth and, and tells you when this happened. And on the bottom left, um, if you look at this histogram of uranium lead ages, if you just focus on the red line for Gallipari, all, you know, many hundreds of analyses, all of the um, zircons from various dikes and igneous units are all less than 10 million years old, with the youngest ones being about one. So again, we, what we've got here is a active metamorphic system um, that's being sampled by erosion and uplift. All right, so uh, um, what we quickly want to do is put together a model of what's happening here. Um, and so we need a couple of things. And th 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 again, this was this model was um, developed for Naga Parbat, even though I was showing a picture of Namshi Barra here. Um, so one thing you need is, is an, a, an orogenic wedge. So you, you're straining the mountain belt um, by collision. And clearly we have that all along the Himalayas. The other thing we would have to have in our model is a a temperature dependent rheology. So we're invoking the standard, the, the shallow crust is um, brittle ductile rheology, a uh, brittle rheology and is um, or called frictional rheology. And then at depth, when it gets hotter, you actually get um, ductile behavior. And then the other thing that we have in our model, and this is by the way, a conceptual model, not, not literally a numerical model, is that we have big rivers and, and really large relief and topography that results in lots of mass wasting and fast erosion. And the question is, when you start comparing this and, and thinking about it, what, what might happen? So on, on the bottom left is a satellite image. Um, it takes a while for most people to see what's going on here. The blue is Naga Parbat. Um, the upper left corner is Kohistan. It's the, it's the um, Gamaga surface and the Indus River is running in between. And so if you draw sort of a conceptual cross section through there and look on the upper right, what we have is the classic rheology we're assuming in this model. We have a, a brittle um, rocks that get stronger to certain depth and then as they get warmer, they finally become weak due to ductile behavior. Now, if we cut a topographic gap, we weaken 
the rocks and we weaken the crust a little bit, not vast amounts, but, you know, say something like 15 or 20 percent, just because there's less load in a really big valley like the Indus cuts. That might encourage some deformation since the whole region is on the verge of deforming. All else being equal, deformation might um, be encouraged to occur there. The thing is, though, if you start deforming into that gap and have exhumation at very high rates, you actually begin to move rocks to the surface without cooling them, and you actually thermally, you thin the crust thermally. And so what happens is the brittle ductile transition shallows, and now your crustal strength profile is much weaker in the gap. And so if that's true, all else being equal, the logical place for rocks to then flow into is the gap because that's a weaker zone. And so what you develop in, the, in this model is, a, is basically a positive feedback between the, the uplift, the thermal thinning, and then the erosion, because you know what's not shown in these simplistic cartoons is the large topography that develops, that feeds the erosion. And this leads to the thing that we, for better or worse, we call the tectonic aneurysm model. So just like when you blow up a balloon, if you've ever blown up a balloon for your children, it's very hard to blow up the balloon in the beginning, but eventually as the balloon thins, it becomes easier and easier to blow up a balloon. And in, in a less positive way, if you know, if in one of your blood vessels has an aneurysm, that's not a good thing, and the same thing happens. So the notion here is that we, once we begin to weaken the deforming crust, it actually can become further weakened. And so these two sketch cartoons um, if you need to get oriented, if that helps you, this is kind of looking at Nanga Parbat to the from the north to the southwest. So in that in so in the cartoon on the right, this would be the Leokar thrust. Here's Nanga Parbat, um, and and then and the, and the little block diagram on the left. We're trying to show the components that are happening, which is that rocks are entering the system in the orogenic wedge. They're they're being they're flowing preferentially into the zone of weakness they cause large peaks to develop because of the rapid rock uplift that creates ferocious exhumation because of the very steep slopes and all that debris can re be removed it doesn't just pile up because you've got a large river there that can carry this debris away and so in the end you get partial melting um, due to decompression you get the shallow um, low pressure metamorphism and um, you basically develop a a a system that's in feedback. So basically what's happening is erosion and deformation are in feedback, and that happens by a coupling that involves the rheology and temperature. And so um, the aneurysm model really would say that once you get a big river cutting into a deforming region, you're likely to expect there to be um, these feedbacks. Now, we're still trying to get back to the Shualex, I promise. Oops, Ren, we're going the wrong direction. So one thing that came up, I just wanted to say while I've got your attention, is that some people were threatened by this for some reason because they thought that we were claiming that um, somehow the tectonics is not important and that you know rain or mountains can cause everything to happen. And that's really not what we're saying. So there's no reason for tectonic angst. Um, there's, of course, there's deformation of mountain belts, and of course it matters. But what our argument has been that the exhumation matters much more than we thought. That rather than um, thinking of mountains as blocks that get uplifted and just eroded, in fact, the exhumation becomes part of the, the entire geodynamic process. And so the, the, the concluding remark here, you know, everyone is in charge and no one is in charge because that's the nature of feedbacks. It's actually a bad question to ask, you know, which came first or which is more important. Once the feedback develops, everything is important. Um, in, in describing what's happening. Now, I just want to just start to get back to the Shualex, which I promised you I would. I'm going to take a tour back to Gialapari. And so now we've got another thematic mapper satellite image. It's very hard on the eyes, I know, early in the morning. But, um, and it's actually, this is almost like an abstract painting. But this feature up on the upper left is Gialapari. Down at the very bottom is Namshi Barwa. This blue ribbon here is the Yarlung Song Po. And the orange arrows are trying to help you see the path of the Yarlung Song Po. So the big waterfall is here, Rainbow Falls. So the river goes, it turns, it's heading east still, then it turns back to the northwest. It rolls around, pulls a complete hairpin, and 
drops elevation. And over this stretch, it drops some 2,000 meters in elevation. And so you can see up on top that the, the river is much wider and, and um, less incisive. Now, um, when you look at a profile of several parameters across that river path or reach, um, a couple of interesting things are noticeable. So on the top, the, the double graph is showing you cooling ages, thermochronological cooling ages of biotite and uranium helium zircon. And those are a minimum over a region where the um, Namshi Barwa is. At that same place where the ages are minimum, this big black um, feature is the, the river power, sorry, in watts per meter squared. So remember, the entire Yarlung Song Po is falling thousands of meters. Um, so the, the, the actual erosive power of the river is enormous. Just where the erosive power of the river is enormous is where you're seeing these very young cooling ages. But these young cooling ages require more than just a few kilometers of erosion to be set. They require 10 or 15 kilometers of, of rock uplift to be set. So you get this really high power river power coinciding with this, this zone of serious rock uplift. On the bottom, you're seeing the profile of the Arlong Song Po, its long profile, defining this giant nig point. And the blue circles are relief, local relief calculated along the stretch. And so the combination of, of the topography and the relief tells you that the, the big mountains are developing over the region of high erosion. So where the erosion power is the highest, not only is the relief high, which isn't that surprising, but the mountains are highest, and those are developing as remnants above this rapidly uplifting block. Um, so that's interesting. And it gets you thinking about um, what's happening. So if you look at the thermochronology at Nafshibarwa, on the left-hand side, these are different dating systems um, defining really rapid cooling. So these rocks in the last several million years have cooled hundreds of degrees, um, so 300 degrees C per million years. In contrast, upstream of Namshibara in, in Tibet, in the Lhasa block, there is a period of somewhat more rapid cooling between five and 10 million years ago, and then really very little has happened, less than 10 degrees C per million years. And so our interpretation is that there was a regional doming and development of a large regional aniform that's reflected in these older cooling ages and fast cooling, but that once the coupling started with, Nunga, with the river and the feedback started, the pop-up of Namshibara basically kept upstream Tibet from eroding. And we, we can look at that next. So here is, you know, we, we've, people have called this Nick point the mother of all Nick points. Um, so here's the long profile of the Arlong Song Po. And, um, you can see the tremendous drop in elevation over, over this region. And schematically on this long profile, I've shown where Namshi Barwa is. And so it's a zone of extremely rap, rapid rock uplift and probably 10 or 20 kilometers of rock uplift in the last two or three million years. And right at that zone, you also have really powerful, this ferocious erosion. And these are basically in balance. So the rack, rock uplift and the erosion are in balance. And so upstream, the Song Po River is almost a lake. You can see that in this image. And downstream is this crazy gorge, um, the steep gorge. Um, now, the interesting thing is people ask, well, wouldn't this just rapidly work its way upstream? And if there was that much of a steep slope, the answer is yes. Um, the, the little inset cartoon on the left here shows a landscape evolution model that suggests that if you just turned off the uplift, then the erosion should push back this nick point by hundreds of kilometers in a million years. If you know the geography there, basically the, the nick point would go all the way back towards Lhasa, a longitude of Lhasa. So our argument is there's no wake or all, all this special activity and you know igneous activity and things is, is located in this very small massif that's been there for a, a, quite a while. And in fact, what you're seeing is, is a, this delicate balance between uplift and erosion. And as I'll say again later, but just say it now, all of Tibet on the east is being kept up at 3,000 meters because of Namshibara. Because if we turned off the uplift, this 
Nick Point would cut back and would remove much of eastern Tibet. But in fact, all these elevations are graded not to sea level, but to this, this, this 3,000 meter elevation. And just to make the point, um, oops, um, just looking um, at just Namshi Barwa again, um, here is the, the upstream watershed for the Yarlung Song Po um, in panel C here. And it's flowing along, can't get out of Tibet until it reaches Namshi Barwa, and then it escapes and it falls off the plateau. And the Namshi Barwa features is found right here. And this is the, the gatekeeper that's keeping all of this river at 3,000 meters or higher. And in the bottom left um, is like an oblique, oblique space shuttle view. It shows you where Namshi Barwa is. You can see the trace of the Yarlung Slung Po into the distance. And all that region of Tibet here is being kept up by Namshi Barwa. And then the river falls off um, and enters the um, Brahmaputra system. So now we're, we're, get, we're going to get to sediments now. I promise you in the last few minutes of this talk, we're getting near the end. Um, we got to get back to the Shualiks. So one thing we did is we wanted to know ab about sources of sediment. So we looked at detrital um, zircon fission track data from modern river sands. So we went to several localities um, around Namshibara that drain directly just this feature also tributaries that drain just the Lhasa block, the island arc rocks um, in southern Tibet. And then we went to um, Pasigat in India, where the Yarlung Sung Po, it's called the Siang, enters the foothills, or leaves the foothills, rather. And you can see that the purple curve here, as expected on this logarithmic plot, you get young ages from Namshibara, no surprise. No surprise that um, the older ages here in green and blue are the kind of ages you'd expect from the Lhasa block, the slow erosion of the Lhasa block. Um, but interestingly, what's shown here in the tan color under the dotted line is the results from Pasigat. And it turns out that 50% of the zircons at Pasigat are young. They're le less than 2 million or 3 million years um, old. And so we know the sediment flux at Pasigat is 210 megatons a year. And these zircons could only be coming from Namshibara. There's no place else to get young zircons in, in Tibet. So all of that 50% of the zircons are coming from this tiny massif. And depending how you define that, the broad range, if you spread that amount of sediment over that area, it implies between 7 and 20 millimeters a year of modern erosion rate. And it also means that of the sediments that are being sampled as represented by zircons, it's, it's really largely coming from Namshi Barwa. It's not a uniform sampling of the entire Tibetan watershed, which is an important lesson. So just to sort of sum up to where we are now, this sort of tectonic aneurysm feedback coupling is probably inevitable in geologic settings where big rivers cross deforming rocks. And so these things probably have existed in the past. They're very small, but they can have a big impact. As I just showed you, they can set regional topographic base level. They can also dominate the sediment flux, at least for brief periods of time. There's really fascinating questions you could ask about whether or not the, the kind of deformation they create is a feedback by creating rough rock fabrics that resist or encourage erosion. We don't know how partial melting in fluids could change the rheology. Um, an another interesting question is the degree to which the mountains themselves change rainfall because they're so high. And then the question of, you know, at the climate time scale, what happens with these tremendous gorges and, and narrow rivers? Um, and, you know, are there different processes in glacial versus interglacial times? And, the, and this is where I'm finally going to try to turn us back to um, the Shawaliks is, are, you know, are they preservable in the rock record? They're really hard to see. They could erode away. So where would you record them? And the question, the places you would record them would be in the sediments, right? So um, back to this cartoon again. Um, if our if our if our left side of this cartoon is Naga Parbat, and we're measuring young ages, this T sub uplift here, we're just running around as geologists on the surface, only measuring here, losing all the earlier record. Where did that record go? Well, of course, that record went. It was transferred very rapidly and deposited in the Shualiks. 
So the older Shawalik should have some record of what in fact has gone on. And so thermochronologists, when they do detrital thermochronology, talk of a thing called lag time, which is just the difference between the, the stratigraphic age of you've sampled and the actual mineral age you measure. So a zero lag time would mean that these rocks up here are getting from closure to the sediment almost instantly, whereas a very long lag time would mean that these things are slowly getting to the surface and eventually getting um, buried. So um, just a few slides left. Um, some, of the some of the first work of this kind that was ever done was actually done in the Potwar Plateau by Kip Cervani and members of the Dartmouth Shower Project, where we had this really nice you know, age control um, on the Chihuahuics. And so what we did was to just date detrital zircons. And the sort of old results are shown here as histograms um, of, of measured age versus the stratigraphic age. And if you notice as you go up and younger rocks, there's um, always a young tail. And the young tail is always very close to the stratigraphic age. So the lag time is very small. So at the time, this is in the, in the um, you know, in the in the 1980s, we kind of thought that's kind of interesting, and we kind of left it at that. Well, actually, though, there's a real interesting story that could be learned here, and so um, I'm just going to briefly introduce some work that was done recently published in Geology Magazine by Gavin et al. They wanted to ask the question: When did the Numshibara uh, feature start doing its thing? And so they went to Shawalik deposits um, in northeastern India, um, shown here at, um, right at the edge of the foothills. So they looked at the last 10 million years of record. They used different high temperature thermochronometers, which is important because those really reflect deep rock uplift. And when you look at what they got, they got these results. So let me, what do these mean? This is a what's called a lag time plot. So the vertical axis is the depositional age of the host sandstone and the um the the x-axis in this case is the 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 minimum sort of peak age for various dating systems and so there's zircon fission track muscovite argon um rutile uranium lead are the various data sets and what's quite striking is that as you look at this plot right about at um call it seven to eight million years, you notice the lag times dra change dramatically. So these 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 diagonal lines of the lag time, so zero million, two million, five million, ten million year old lag times. And you notice in the older, older Shawalik rocks, the lag times are significant, but then all of a sudden by seven million years, the lag time is only two million years. So their argument, and this is strong evidence, that it, there's a very clear signal that Namshi Barwa started to become hyperactive um, seven to eight million years ago. So we could say, well, what about Nangan Parbat? And so I took Kip Cervani's data and I, I reanalyzed it with a modern approach. And that's shown in these red um, boxes. And um, I also included some um, Muscovite argon work that Yanni Najman did um, for the Kamli Al formation. And they're superimposed here. And what's really interesting is that compared to Namshi Bar, the, 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 the story is very similar for younger deposits. But it seems like Nanga Parbat's been around longer because you can see at the bottom right that um, you have these really pretty low lag times going all the way back to 18 million. And so they, one thing you could argue for perhaps is that Nanga Parbat. Um, was active across the entire Shawalik time span at, in the pot war. And so just you know to, to point out these trends, the blue line shows how at Namshi Barwa we have evidence for a rapid increase at seven million or eight million years. Whereas, you know, in the pot war, you know, maybe there's some evidence from the the Argon results for things starting 18 million, but you have a much longer record of um, at least young young minerals in the detrital samples, and so that you know to me really some really exciting questions that are not yet answered. But you know some of the people that are listening to this might be young scientists that can do this. Is one thing is how can, can we show that the, this young signal uh, for the young zircons is this actually coming from Nanga Parbat? 
are there ways we can trace that and and determine whether that's just um, noise from other other rapidly uplifting spots or in fact whether um, whether it's all coming from this small area and of course the answer to that question is really important for studies of the, of the Shawaliks because in fact um, if it is coming from Nanga Parbat it suggests based on the Namshi Bar experience that a large fraction of the um, Shawalik mass is actually coming from a very small area this tiny metamorphic massif now we know from detrital mineral studies that you know not all the Shawaliks come from there and like the blue green hornblende story and Kohistan being unroofed so another interesting question that you know needs to be done with the modern study is you know what are the the source area proportions for the Shawalik group so can we use you know detrital geochronology to learn about what mix of terrains in the hinterland you know um, fed the Shawaliks and created these deposits and I think the tools are now available to do that so this is be a great time to do such a study so um, I've run slightly long I apologize um, and I'm done um, so um, in some way I will try to relinquish my screen screen um, and I think I've done that and I will free you all and we should be done thank you very much for listening well thank you very much peter it's a wonderful to see the variety of different techniques being applied to those mineral grains and startling to see the the detailed structure of some of those zircon crystals that was uh, really quite amazing to see those photomicrographs I, i've got a quick question just to get rolling here a little bit but it, it seems uh your your discussion of the Shawaliks uh, on that last slide, maybe in particular, where you've got a, a relatively uniform pattern extending back at least four or five million years, and it, it, it I guess it suggests that the the process is in some kind of a of a steady state. I mean, what what is the reason for the that continuous pattern going back? Well, so. Um that's why I think a modern study is needed to get at the at the actual more of a mass balance, bring in the mass balance and then look at the sort of more of the amounts of these components. But what the because what the lag time plot is is focusing on just the youngest population and seeing the offset. So that's just only talking about that. So there are other older zircons and they would represent other terrains. And so if you looked at the whole data set, you would begin to be able with a more modern approach, you could probably you know, begin to map out um, where these things came from it. And we can do a thing called double dating where we can date the cooling age of the mineral, but we can also date the uranium lead age of the zircon. So we know where, like, was this a Karakorn batholith? Was it from Gilgit batholith? Was it, you know, or was it Nagaparbat? Or was it the foothills? And so narrowly speaking, all you can get from that plot is telling you that somewhere there is a two million year old zircon source being rapidly exhumed um, for the last 20 or 18 million years. My gut feeling is it's Naga Parbat, but I can't prove that because it could just be that different different regions, you know, uplifted rapidly at different points and the in the averaging just sort of looks like there's a single source. So we we you know that work that needs that really needs to be done. So I, I'd be nervous about calling it steady state because steady state sort of suggesting a, there's a mass balance component there that you know that's that's missing from this analysis. Uh -huh. The other thing, just to, just to have one final thought here from my side, is the uh, the the idea that these relatively small, uh, actively metamorph metamorphosing zones are acting as essentially buttresses to to hold up the entire Tibetan drainage system or, or, or the Tibetan plateau effectively is, is really quite an extraordinary concept. And, and, and you could sort of do a, a, a mental picture and say, well, if they, if, if they weren't there, the geomorphology of the, of the plateau might be very different because you would have had a headward incision. Oh, I mean, it, it's, it's even more than that, right? Because the, um, Right now, the you know t t the Himalayan Tibetan system has a, the the wedge is very it's backed by Tibetan plateau, but if you would actually um, let the Yarlung Songpo you know sliced back, you'd have a very narrow origin because now you would have a large 
major river valley there. And so you would probably change the entire dynamics of faulting as well um, to some degree of a thought experiment. So, you know, so I think, you know, this is still a little controversial, but it, you know, it, some really interesting thought experiments. Um, you know, there's been some people making claims about Namchi Barra that we don't like, but, you know, um, how stable is stable? And, you know, in this balance of uplift and erosion, you know, um, what if it flickers? What if, what if erosion wins a little bit or, or, or um, what if uplift wins? Then if you, if uplift wins, you block the Yarlung Slung Po completely. You could actually divert the Yarlung Slung Po over the, directly into India. <laughs> or, you know, what if a big, what, what happens during glaciation? Um, we know there was a 600 meter deep freshwater lake there during the last glaciation because uh, it was of, of an ice dam. So, you know, the, the, you get to some really, really fun landscape questions um, that, that come from that, you know, so. Um, uh, uh, we have two questions, Professor Bob, uh, Ahmad Ghani. Please uh, unmute your mic, introduce yourself and ask questions. Hi, uh, thank Hi. you so much, Peter, for a very, very nice talk and uh, taking us uh, in comparison for Nanga Parbat and Namche Parbat. So my question is that uh, about the shape of these syntaxes, for example, like when we look at Nanga Parbat and just west of it, we look at the Indus syntaxes. So these right. syntaxes are more or less north south, north south aligned in this uh, in, in this whole uh, tectonic scenario. Right. How you look at this? Uh, like the appetite fission tracks coming out of in the syntaxes are around three to five million years, and the appetite fission track coming out of Nanga Purba syntaxes are around two to three million years. And then we see a lot of seismicity in this. Uh, zone between them in the syntaxes coming down to the hazard syntaxes how you think what is going on in the foreland is actually influencing uh, the things uh, in, in the back side of it like the deformation not like source to sink right. but the deformation in the in the foreland is right how it's well sure well i think i think two one comment is that you know um there's a lot of excitement among people for things like appetite helium and appetite fission track because it's a very low temperature system. But on the other hand, it's a low temperature system. So it's very easy to set that by relatively minor erosion. You know, the appetite helium system, for instance, you can set just by incision of a block without even any uplift. So I, I'm that's, I think it's not surprising that they're widespread um, younger, you know, appetite fission track ages just because it's not that hard it's hard not to have a young age in some ways. Um, it's almost more spectacular than a young, than an, um, an old age is more spectacular than a young age. As terms of the actual structure, I mean, those are, those are good questions about how, how this straining wedge actually works in Pakistan when you get up to the Northwest, because clearly you've got the, the, the structures in the, the gel, you know, the reentrant and the Hazara syntaxis, and then you've got this, but you know, I guess the one thing that's dangerous is just because rocks form a looped structure, you know, there, there are many ways of doing that. You know, interfering fault patterns. You know, Nanga Parbat is is a, it's a weird idea. It's a half window, right? You had north south overthrust, and then a dome um, deforms the Indian crust off from underneath. You know, and and the structures are thrust, but they're so steep. You know, whether the fault plane solutions are normal or thrust or kind of it's a vertical fault. So I, I would like to know the answer to your question. Actually, is you know what is the what is the linkage at depth um, that that gets the deformation up into the hinterland, you know, from farther below? Let me just throw one crazy thought out there, um, since it's it's late at night here, so I'm allowed to be crazy. You know, one thing that's interesting, right, is that in the potwar you have salt, and so in fact um, the 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 taper of the wedge is different. Um, there and so I don't know what that might do to um, does that matter or not I'm not the person there's probably people on this call that can do much better than I can but you know what happens if you if you encounter that salt or you you change you, you lower the taper of the wedge what happens in the hinterland uh, I don't know if anyone's ever ever thought about that 
either we assume that salt was always there, but what if the salt arrived and the, the thrust belt scooted out? What would happen, you know, in the hinterland? So anyway, that's that's a evasive answer, maybe, but um, but I'll answer ask you that question. Uh, so uh, just to comment on that. Uh, so like looking at this hazard syntax, for example, there's this interference pattern from both sides, like from northwestern India and from the Pakistan side. And right. one can like see that something is like going on in this blocking, blocking or more of the interference. And then when we see in the hinterland law seismicity coming on, so some sort of uh, segmentation in the tectonic wedge, maybe. Yeah, that's. I mean, I, I'm. This is, you know, I have not followed this much lately, but I seem to remember long ago. Was it Leonard or Sieber or someone was talking about, um, you know, offsets at depth, um, you know, sort of the mid crustal structure. Um, um, I think we need more data, but yeah, is is it? It's it's a complicated, and interesting area, and you know, clearly, what's happening deeper and farther north is is got to be at some level connected to that. Um, but I, I guess I can't comment more than that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for the question. OK, ne next question is from Professor Andrew Meech. Please uh, unmute yourself. Hi. Uh, good morning, Peter. It's uh, 1 30 hey. a.m. Is it out there in uh, in uh, Pennsylvania? It is. Yes. Well, My you're, you're still firing on all cylinders. No, I don't know. I think I only got a few cylinders left, but anyway. That was <laughs> That's a fabulous H. talk. Very, yeah, there you go. A very thought-provoking talk and a very, very impressive body of work. Uh, you're really congratulated for that, in, uh, especially. What do, what do you think the, uh, why, what, what are the conditions for the onset of aneurysm-like behavior? Because I liked your balloon analogy, having actually blown up a few balloons in my time. Um, why is it that none of the other transverse rivers anywhere else across the Himalaya have exhibited the same kind of uh, behavior? Is it is it the stream power uh, argument that you made for the ends? Uh, you know that you're not yeah. seeing the same kind of thing in the Kali Gandaki or any of the other major transverse rivers. Well, but the thing is, they those I think I think you've hit on it. I think um, and we, and I, I've. I've for 20 years been beating on Peter Coons to try to come up with a Coons number um, for what we need. <laughs> but I think what it is, is that you need a really, you need a like a four or five kilometer deep gorge that's about as wide, right? Because a, a notch doesn't work and a big flat thing doesn't work. You need to actually rapidly cut with a lot of stream power enough that you get advection of isotherms and thinning, you know, thermal thinning. And I think these other mm. rivers are fully transverse. They just don't have the, you know, they're, they're not truly cutting across. They don't have the water flow to get there. Now, I, I, I think some of some of these, which one, I'm trying to think one of, at least one of those I thought was it the Arun. People have talked about an anticlinal, anaformal response, sort of the river anticline idea. But yeah. but I think to really, you know, to make this thing really fly as an aneurysm, you know, in our model, You've got to you've got to get the ductile rocks decompressing fast and melting and getting yes. the metamorphic effects. And then you know I I I'd love to see some competent modeler start put you know what happens when rocks partially melt right because they're they're getting ductally the crust is getting ductally thin but then if you start partially melting you know you're really going to weaken it even more as as a threshold effect. So I think I think part of it is you know you need to get there. So maybe those are incipient. We, you know we've argued that the Saint Elias Range is a a third natural example. Um, yeah. Where the Malaspina emerges sort of back in there. There's yeah. Yes. There's young zircon fission track ages, but they're they're too. You know they they can't just be set by glacial incision because that would require is a, you know a focus of rapid rock uplift. So you know it's it's possible you know how these things look at different ages. You know this is a a crazed model in which we have two examples and maybe a third yeah. um, and they probably don't leave themselves a record and you know there's probably you know our metamorphic hotspots in new hampshire are these aneurysms uh, yeah. i don't know um yeah so um but um, yeah so I, I would put my i put my money if that means anything at all on um not enough stream power and not a not a big enough valley 
Yeah, you don't, you don't, you, what, what, what effect, and this is sort of following up on Ahmad Ghani's question to you, what effect do you think the being at the edges of the Indian plate have? Does the, does the nature of the lower plate have any bearing on the fact that you have this sustained pattern of exhumation at the corners only? Or is it simply the runaway uh, thing that, well, that yeah, that's an interesting that you're describing? You know, my brain hurts when I try to think about frames of reference at the plate corners, right? Because you have incoming material yeah. that's accreting, but you're also on strike slip. So, I mean, I know that yeah. one of the things that always drove Peter Kuhn's nuts was when, you know, someone would claim that they they dated a mica and dated extension of all of Tibet. But, you know, basically, certainly at the plate corners, you should have a constant, you, you should constantly be transferring regimes from from convergence to strike slip to normal yeah. faulting as rocks move through the system. And so, I, you know, I think, um, again, I, I think the corners are a little bit special because they, they are, you know, you, you do have the chance for things like river capture and strike slip is involved in there as well. I mean, at, at, a, at a finer scale, there have been arguments for both Namshi Bar and Naga Parbat for some strike slip, you know, oblique slip component. Um, if that important, I don't yeah. know. But it's certainly, you know, it, it's sort of a, it, it's a different place. But of course, the, the counter argument, the, the aneurysm person's counter argument is what really matters is the big river, right? Because that's yeah. the place where you can fall off the plateau. So if you were going to press me on, I would say St. Elias is the, a young baby aneurysm with glacial over, overtones, that Namshi Barwa is younger and that uh, is medium age, and that Naga Parbat's more mature, that the, the strain is exquisitely focused there and that the Indus now is, is completely cut through and, you know, you don't have the quite the same Nick zone that you do um, in Namshi Barwa. Or it's yeah. just, you know, the other the other great fear of tectonics is each one of these is different. There is no commonality to anything, you know, and the yeah. geology of the, of the East is just different enough that, you know, um, everything is special. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Okay, now we have uh, Catherine Bagley. Please uh, unmute yourself. Thank sure, you. thank you. Uh, Thank you very much, Peter. That was really interesting. Um, and I have a question that may be also vexing. Um, and that is, can you tell anything from your lag time plots about what the elevation of the mountain range was, of the source areas was? Um, what's the expression about angels rush in or, or fools rush in? <laughs> I mean, you know, no, the answer, the, the, the correct answer is no. Mm -hmm. Because, because I mean, what, what you know, all, when you have a cooling age, right? It, it just tells you when the rock cooled, and if you then want to model that, you can do a thermokinematic model and say, well, you know, at a certain cooling rate, that is a certain isothermal structure, is a certain uplift erosion rate, but that still is only giving you the the rock uplift component, and you know what the topographic heights are, is you know is the classic conundrum of people wanting to know paleo elevation. And, and and what that's one thing you cannot get from thermocron is is paleo elevation. You can make complicated arguments based on that, but but in the end, it's just a puffball because you can't. You know, it just depends what the surface processes are doing and how the drainages are integrated. And um, you know, all, all I can tell you from the thermocron is these rocks moved relative to the surface. Um, can you tell? So they, can you tell anything about, for example, even if it's not. Um, even if you're not able to say anything about, say, absolute elevation, can you, from the some of the inflection points in your lag time plots, can you talk? Can you infer changes in elevation? For example, suddenly the source areas were higher, or suddenly the source areas were lower. You know, again, um, you know, I see Doug is on the call. Um, I should just throw it off to him. But you mm -hmm. know, the problem is that you have. Um, you know, it, it depends on your landscape evolution model and, um, you know, you know their, their lag times and it depends how things integrate and where your samples are. So I think it's, it's again, dangerous to, you know, I mean, you, can, you know, there's some things you can say, like if you have a zircon fission track age, it's young, it had to come up 10 kilometers and there's no way that can be done by rearranging rivers. You need, you know, but, but what the actual elevations were and, you know, was it a high peak or are you talking about a plateau? You, you really can't do that with the simple, you know, with the lag time plots there. 
they're too blunt a tool. Um, so, I mean, you know, yeah, turning that around, if, if you were to actually look at the evolution of an origin and, and you know, obviously if, if the lag times are changing, that suggests that there's, you know, more rapid uplift and erosion, that would maybe suggest that you're getting higher mountains. But, you know, as we all know, you can actually grow mountains. You, you can actually grow peak elevations even when you lower the average elevation, right? Because um, the peaks grow as fangs while everything is getting lower. So, you know, it depends very much if you're asking a climate question, you know, are you, uh, you know, an obstacle to circulation? I mean, the, I, I would think it'd be very dangerous to do that myself. Oh, yeah, thank you. Well, m my motivation is partly thinking as somebody who uh, about the mammals and how some of the immigrants got there and why more immigrants didn't get there and what role the mountain ranges played in all of that and whether the what we're able to uh, when we're able to reconstruct these tectonic histories, what that implies about the biogeography of the mammals. Yeah, interesting. I mean, not mammals, but it turns out in in um, in Tibet and and sort of the surrounding areas, there's been a lot of um, work on fishes, especially I guess I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, the schizothorax fishes, whatever the hell those are, and and apparently there's a whole story that people come up with molecular biology about how, you know, they they can, but the the only problem, so here's the problem is that the biologist did the molecular work on the fishes, but then if you look read the paper carefully. They actually took Maron Clark's tall story about river drainage rearrangement and they conveniently connected the two. So they didn't independently say, oh, this is how the rivers must have connected. Oh, look, someone's written about it. They kind of said, hmm, we have this molecular data and here, here's a model for river capture. But, you know, it, 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 it's kind of nice. It kind of makes sense in terms of the, the fish you see in the Yarlung Song Po. Although I don't know what kind of fish swim in that river because it's really not, um, it's not the most swimmable of rivers. <laughs> so. Right. Well, that's interesting. Actually, my husband is an ichthyologist and works ah. on some problems in Western North America. So I know what kind of fish swim in those rivers. Okay. They're small and they swim really fast, like trout. <laughs> <laughs> well, people have tried to kayak the Yarlung Song Po, and unfortunately, some of them have died. And much of the kayaking consists of portaging your kayak. 10 kilometers over a high pass, putting the boat in the water for 50 meters and then getting out and portaging again. <laughs> because there's, when we first worked there, we were told, um, I don't know if we were trying, people trying to avoid us to, to, to not come work there, but you know, Naga Parba is wonderful. I mean, it's, it's, actually, it's a little dry, but it's hot, it's nice place. But <laughs> Nafshibara is really wet and there are, there are lions, poisonous snakes, and leeches. Um, and so there's some of the Chinese, our colleagues at Chengdu did a heroic transect around the thing. You know, there, there are 45 degree slopes, mud slopes that go right down into the river and they had to cross those and they had to sleep in the rain constantly and cover in leeches and then, you know, snakes at your head height. It's just, you know, it's just, not, it's, it's just a different world um, in terms of um, the world there, but anyway. Well, well, Peter, listen, uh, thank you ever so much for your presentation, and uh, thank everybody for joining us this afternoon, this morning, this evening, wherever you are, and a uh, wonderful uh, uh, story there, Peter, about the, the records of uplift and, and erosion. And I think that one of the things that's, that's uh, compelling to me is that, is that in Pakistan, you, you've got this very unique place. I mean, Nanga Parbat is, a, is an extraordinary unique situation and as Peter's just mentioned of course wonderfully accessible with the Karakoram Highway and uh, I think a, a, a beautiful natural laboratory for source to sink studies because you've got the you've got the source right there and then you've got the studies in the Shawaliks and uh, I would encourage uh, people who are on this call to to consider further work that could be done in looking at the uh, evolution of the mineral grains in the Shawaliks and I think Peter some of your uh, thoughts about uh, doing additional work. Uh, it'd be wonderful if we could uh, maybe uh, accelerate that somehow. And I and I sure, hope that, sure. that perhaps there's some collaborations with some of the people in the in the audience and and some of the participants in this call uh, that could do that. Yeah, be great. So, uh, 
Just, just don't make me climb anymore. I'm, those days are over. No, no, no. You can. The measured sections are there. You can. We can yeah. take you by. by <laughs> we'll take you out to the to the measured section and allow you to sample a known aged rock. It's a wonderful right. place. Exactly. The old man's. I'm going to go down to the Shawalix now and gentle <laughs> terrain. <laughs> okay. Unless we have any any more questions, I think we'll uh, we'll call it a day. Uh, All right. Yes, thank, thank everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All right, Thank bye. You. Good night, Peter. Get some sleep.